Welcome. In this session in Linear Data Analysis, we'll explore the curse of dimensionality, assuming that data have a Gaussian or normal distribution. What we mean by that is, suppose that our data come in as a matrix A, and these are all real numbers, there are M observations and N variables. What we'll do is we'll standardize this as a matrix C, and that standardization is the usual one. So C is now a zero mean matrix, and each column has a unit um, standard deviation. So we form the variate um, as usual by, uh, this is represented in statistics by X, and this is a, a, the rows of our matrix, and each one of these entries samples the columns of our standardized data. In statistics, what we usually do is we assume that the variates are independent and identically distributed. And in this case, what we're supposing is they have a Gaussian or normal distribution, and that their mean is zero, and that their standard deviation is one. And that comes out of our standardization of our original data. The probability density function is a Gaussian, and there's a factor that's used uh, in statistics to adjust for the volume uh, depending on the number of dimensions. So that is our usual Gaussian that we've used, that we've come across previously in this course and then there's a factor that we have to multiply it by that depends on the number of dimensions. Now one question that we might ask is how frequently does zero appear? So if it's one dimension we have a very quick answer and that is it's about 40%. But what happens when we vary the number of dimensions that we're exploring? Well, if it's in one, if it's 0D, which is the worst case, that's a point, and of course it's always present. If it's 1D and it follows a, the usual bell curve that we're, uh, we've often seen, it's about 40%. Once we get into two dimensions, that's now down around less than 20%. And by the time we're in three dimensions, it's less than 10% and so on. And this has um, decayed very, very rapidly. So what that means is in high dimensions, exactly zero data almost never appear. And that, that raises the question, well, how often does data that's pretty close to the zero vector appear? Well, that is in statistics and physics, a measure of what's called the half width of the Gaussian. So this is measured as the full width at half maximum, and what that means is it's the, it's the set of all vectors that have a density that's one half of the peak. So to what we do is we suppose that there's some value alpha, we're going to take alpha equal to one half because that's the usual way to look at it, and uh, when we do that, what we want to do is we want to say what's the probability of a variate appearing, a multi um, dimensional variate appearing divided by the probability of the zero vector and set that to alpha. And we can work through the exponential on the previous slides and we'll find that our z alpha is minus 2 times the log of alpha. So when we set alpha equal to um, 1 half, z alpha will be about 1.38. So now we can ask how frequently does in one dimension how frequently does a scalar value u appear? So u is our unknown, and what we get is the traditional Gaussian or bell curve. So this represents the probability that a value u will appear. And the question is, what happens for alpha of 0.5? Well, what we do is we take the um, we take the zero value and then we work out the z alpha, so we go out that far on each side, and what we get is this would be a measure of the points that have a probability of being within 0.5 of the zero value, or the mean. And we can then compute the area by integrating this. So we, that would move us from a probability density function to a probab to a cumulative distribution, and when we do that, we get approximately 76% of the data are contained within this um, alpha equals one-half zone. And that means that 24% are in the tails. And we can visualize that also. So here, what we saw was that, uh, let's go back, is that 76% of our data are located centrally, and now 24% of our data are in the tails of the distribution. 
what happens in two dimensions. How frequently does a vector, a two-dimensional vector, appear? Well, we can work through the probability distribution, and what we get is this. It's basically a bell curve that is spun around the, the vertical axis. We note immediately that there's been a change in the height, and that is that the probability distribution in um, two dimensions, the chance of the zero vector is much, much less than it was in one dimension. And that's a consequence of requiring this to integrate to a unit volume. So now a question is, how much of that is central and how much is in the tails? Well, what we find is when we do this integration that only 50% of the data are in the central portion and that means that 50% have to be in the tails, right? Oh, by the way, those of you who think this would make a cool rocket cone, it wouldn't make a very good rocket cone. You can see over here that this is a concave function and it would really disturb the airflow if you tried to use that as a, as a rocket cone. So now what we can do is we can use MATLAB to visualize the volume under the bell shape that uh, is, has a probability greater than one half, right? So what that means is that this is the shape of the um, volume that contains the non-central part of the data. So what we have in one dimension is the central part contains about 76% of our data. If we go into two dimensions, we're finding that close to the origin only contains 50%. What happens as we increase the number of dimensions? Well, we, it's really hard to try to, dis, to uh, represent integrals of three-dimensional functions, so let's go into some math. So what we did was we assumed that these variates are uh, independent and identical distributions, and in particular they're Gaussian, so they have a zero mean and a unit variance. Well, that means that these variates have to follow a chi-squared distribution. Chi-squared distributions pop up every now and then in statistics, and this is one of the places they pop up. So what that gives us, the chi-squared distribution lets us calculate the area under the curve for, in our case, we used 2, but now we can insert any n here, and we could find that for um, using our z alpha that we previously calculated. So this would be referred to as the, this is often in statistics, the capital F sub chi squared of, your, of the um, score of your variate. So this, there aren't easy um, solutions for this, but there are lots of library functions we can use to numerically approximate it. So now let's ask ourselves, what, how big is the central area of our data as we increase the number of variables in the data, as we increase the size of our matrix, as we increase the number of dimensions that we're looking at. Those are all different ways of saying the same thing. When we're at one dimension and we take our little z alpha of about 1.38, um, what we find is that 76% of our data are contained centrally and the rest are not. When we compute this chi-squared cumulative distribution function for two dimensions, what we see is half of the data are located centrally. As we increase to three dimensions, we see that less than 30% are located centrally. As we go to five dimensions, it's less than 10% are located centrally. And by the time we're at nine dimensions, more or less none of our data are located centrally. All of our data are in the tails of the Gaussian distribution. So let's summarize this. What we assumed under the IID assumption was that our data have been standardized. And as the number of variables in our problem increases, the probability of finding the zero vector is vanishingly small. The probability of finding central data, things within an alpha of one half, vanishingly small. The probability of finding um, our data in the tails of the distribution it approaches certainty. And this we can summarize as the Gaussian version of the curse of dimensionality. So what have we learned in this lecture? Well, we're now able to recognize high-dimensional data 
we're able to explain dimensionality using a hypercube, which is a simple geometric construct. And we can use our, these principles to select lower dimensions to project our data to for subsequent data analysis.